Hello, my name is Per Kainz. I'm an Associate Professor of Computer Science at Linköping University in Sweden. And today I'm going to present our paper on elements of AI, teaching the basics of AI to everyone in Sweden. And this is joint work with Timur Roos from University of Helsinki. So the background is that we see a convergence between the digital and the physical world, where the, the, the digital world is becoming as important as the physical. And that we also see that most of the innovations in society uh, have some software component uh, and that the scale, speed, complexity uh, of the resulting applications when we start to digitize things uh, require uh, support and automation. And that AI is one of these enablers uh, of the automation of tasks that previously only people could do. So in the end, what we need is that people need to be able to solve problems and work together with digital tools and AI. Uh, and we see a wide range of applications of AI, everything from kind of computer vision, voice recognition. So, I mean, today the computers are able to basically have a basic understanding of the world around us based on information from cameras, microphones, and so on. And that it's starting to uh, be able to process, analyze uh, uh, natural language uh, and be able to ask questions or generate natural language text and so on. And of course, it supports us in, in all aspects of large scale data analysis. So we see that the, the range of AI applications is growing ever wider uh, over time. Uh, but what we also see is that it's still the case that uh, even though machines are significantly better than us in specific tasks, I mean, chess is one of these common examples, it's still the case that the combinations of humans and chess playing machines, for example, is better than both the best humans and the best chess playing uh, computer programs. And it's actually also the case that if you combine multiple people together with multiple tools, you, you get even better results. Uh, so, it's, so it's not a question about either AI or people, but rather how do we combine uh, AI and people together? And we can see the same result, for example, in medical diagnosis, where people and uh, AI-based diagnostic tools make different types of mistakes. So if you combine them, you get a better uh, outcome than either on their own. However, uh, it's not the same thing to play, for example, chess with uh, manually by yourself compared to playing chess with one of these computer tools. So we really need to learn how to use this tool effectively. Uh, so we need to really support this professional development so that people become better at doing their work together with these kind of tools. Uh, so I think this is kind of one key message. It's not about uh, either humans or AI, but rather the combinations of human and AI. And in order to be able to support this, we need to educate people in how to effectively use these tools. A another reason why we absolutely need these AI-based tools is that the, the amount of information, the, basically the, the foundations upon which we can make our decisions is basically growing exponentially. So here I'm just taking an example from medicine. Uh, where we see that both the number of sources of information, but also the kind of the general knowledge in the area is growing uh, exponentially. Uh, uh, so if you just take a concrete example of a medical doctor that finished his or her uh, degree and that assuming that they know everything there is to know uh, about medicine at that point where, where they finished their education and further assume that the, uh, we have a doubling rate of the information uh, of every two years. So the, the amount of knowledge doubles every two years. Then it means that after two years after the education, this uh, medical doctor will only know half of all the available knowledge. After four years, it will only know a quarter. After six years, it will know an eighth. Uh, after eight years, it will know a sixteenth. Now we're below 10% of all the available knowledge uh, that this person has, unless he or she has really been keeping up with this pace. So what are some consequences of this? Well, first of all, is that we will need to learn much more after we finish our education as we did during our education. Secondly, is that the amount of information that we wish we could include in our university education, for example, where I mostly work, will, will uh, always grow faster. Uh, I mean, basically, our uh, education programs are a fixed length and amount of information and knowledge we wish we could fit into that fixed length is growing, which means that our education, uh, I mean, primary, secondary, and tertiary education will, will cover less and less of all the possible knowledge in the world. 
And of course, this leads to specialization is what, what we see today. But the third uh, is that we really need to use tools. So how come that we're managing this uh, explosion of information? Well, for example, using very powerful search engines and so on to, to rapidly find what's most relevant rather than we have to, to read through a lot of material and so on. So that's just one example of how we use AI-based tools to be able to deal with this uh, huge amount of information so that we can actually uh, do our best to base our decisions on the best available information. So all of this leads to that uh, there is a, there is a huge um, need for education in the area of AI. Uh, and what I think is really key here is that it's not something for the specialized, it's not something only for the few, but actually something for everyone. Everyone needs to know the basics of AI, needs to know the fundamental parts and understand roughly how does this influence me and, and my work and my, uh, my just my, my existence as a, as a citizen on this uh, earth. Uh, and I really think this is a key fundamental uh, knowledge in order to be an active and critical citizen in today's uh, digitized society. Uh, so therefore, uh, I'm very proud that uh, we have this course, uh, Elements of AI. So this course was developed by Timo Luz uh, at the University of Helsinki originally. And uh, starting in 2019, uh, it has also been introduced into Sweden. Uh, so we launched uh, the course in, in Sweden uh, with the goal of basically educating uh, as many people as possible in Sweden, just like they did in Finland, uh, where they had a goal of educating at least 1% of the population in the basics of AI. Uh, and of course, we wanted to do the same uh, in Sweden. Uh, and you can also get university credits for this course uh, so that uh, uh, not only can you just learn the material, but you can actually get uh, university credentials, credits for the course. Uh, so uh, uh, this course in Sweden is also part of a larger program called AI Competence for Sweden, uh, which was funded by the, the, the Swedish government uh, with the goal of uh, promoting uh, increased knowledge about AI in both the private and the public sector to strengthen the competitiveness and improve welfare. Uh, so this was one uh, part of this larger initiative. Uh, so the content of this course uh, it has six parts. The first part is what is AI? Very good place to start. Uh, the second is about how do you use AI to, to solve problems or rather how does AI solve problems? For example, by enumerating all the different uh, possibilities and then searching, trying out different uh, alternatives until a solution is found. And here we have, for example, many of these uh, game playing uh, algorithms uh, that you can use uh, or you can using these kind of techniques. The third is like, uh, how do we get the, how do we actually use AI in the real world, which is messy and uncertain and so on. So it's really about focusing on how do we represent and how do we deal with uncertainty. In this case, we would use probabilities as one way of doing it and how we can update our beliefs about the world using something called the base rule, which provides it with a, with a uh, well-founded way of uh, um, estimating how likely something is. Uh, the fourth part, uh, then we move into machine learning, uh, talking about different types of machine learning, uh, give two examples, in this case, nearest neighbor classification and regression. And then we move on to neural networks, which of course is uh, something that's very popular these days, uh, describing the kind of basic structure, how do you build and how do you train these networks? And then we actually look a bit more at more advanced uh, neural network uh, architectures, uh, such as generative adversarial networks. And then uh, the course is concluded with the sixth module, which is about implications in the broader uh, society, which I think today is, is kind of maybe uh, becoming maybe one of the most uh, important parts of AI to really understand what are the social implications, what are ethical aspects of AI and so forth. And together, even though it's a relatively short course, I mean, it's six modules, it's uh, roughly, I don't know, 40 to 60 hours, depending on uh, your level of sophistication. Uh, but I mean, it's a small course. It still gives you this broad overview of the, the important parts of AI. Uh, so just to give an example of the first part, uh, there are three subparts here. So how would you define AI is the first part. And here we also see that there are a number of different types of uh, exercises. 
So the multiple choice questions, uh, there are several of those where you need to select uh, one or more uh, correct alternatives. So basically find all the correct alternatives. Uh, but then there's also open and the essay questions. Uh, for example, you're here supposed to critique uh, the AI definitions that are used and then provide your own definition of an AI or uh, AI definition. Uh, so this is just an example of an open-ended essay question. And in or so of course, the multiple choice questions uh, and the free text uh, answers where there's like a numerical answer, they are graded automatically. But these essay questions, uh, here we use peer review. So first of all, at least three of your colleagues in the course needs to uh, grade the, the um, exercise and you have to do the same. So you have to grade three exercises. And when that is done, we get a summary and then we uh, either pass or fail each of these uh, assignments. And you need to have at least 50% correct of all the questions in order to pass the course. So why do I think Elements of AI is such a nice course? So first of all, I think it gives a good introduction to what AI is, uh, and it's not focusing just on neural network-based machine learning, which is uh, in some sense the, the, the top of the hype today, but actually gives a broad perspective on AI. So uh, even though, it, as I said, it's, it's a short course, it still manages to give this breadth, and it also managed to give you one step beyond the buzzwords, actually give you some concrete examples of AI techniques. Of course, you will not be able to know all the intricate details, but you will have a rough understanding how do these algorithms actually look like and how do they work. And I really think that's important to, to move beyond the hype and more into reality. Uh, and uh, this course has been extremely well uh, received all over the world, actually. Uh, so it's, uh, it has been ranked by Class Central as the best online computer science course in the world, which I think is quite uh, amazing. Uh, so it just shows that the people in Finland have done a great job uh, in developing this course. Uh, so in Sweden, in order to reach uh, as large part of the population as possible, we have uh, what we call an AI challenge, where more than 120 companies from basically all walks of society uh, pledging that a certain percentage of their uh, sorry, employees will take this course and promote this internally and include it into uh, professional development programs and so on. Uh, so the results so far is that worldwide, Almost 700,000 people have started this course, and more than 83,000 have completed the course. Uh, and for the Swedish numbers, uh, we have more than 33,000 signups for the Swedish course in the Swedish language, that is. Uh, and uh, of them, 6,500, more than 6,500 have passed the course, completed the course. And, and this might sound relatively low, but actually, this kind of 20% uh, uh, completion rate is actually good when it comes to this kind of on, open online courses, which normally lies around, I mean, single digit uh, percent uh, completion rate. So this is a good, a good thing. Uh, from a Swedish perspective, we also have 10,000 people that have taken the English course, uh, but uh, signed up with Sweden as their country. And of these um, <clears throat> about 40, 40 45,000 people, uh, more than 3,000 have actually received university credits for this course, uh, which I think is quite quite amazing uh, in just two years to be able to achieve this. So if we look at the university course, <clears throat> uh, so basically uh, what we have done is that the, the, the course material is the open online course. Uh, and if you pass the open online course, you get an, a certificate. This certificate you will upload to the university, uh, well, our uh, content learning management system. And there you will also do a validation test because we cannot guarantee that it was actually you who, who kind of completed the online course. So therefore we do a validation with six questions of the same type as if in the in the online content, uh, in an online course, just to show that you've understood it. Uh, and um, uh, what we also try to do is to have a continuous admittance. So it means that uh, there is a course for every semester uh, and that we have the course open for late admittance throughout the year. So basically we have a course that runs throughout all of the year, which we are examining continuously. So every week we report the new results uh, and every week new students are admitted to the course. And actually we're able to manage this course with thousands of students with relatively modest, I mean, so basically I have a, a student that's working roughly 
30 percent i mean or i have one phd student and one uh, regular student uh, that working roughly 30 to 40 percent together uh, in maintaining this course and then i'm supervising it uh, taking care of the examination uh, answering questions and so on so it's actually possible to scale up this course and introduce it in the regular university education program uh, which i think is quite quite nice uh, we can also see that we have a, a large number of students and that we have a very diverse set of students. We roughly have 40% uh, women uh, in all the courses. We have students of all ages from uh, just as finishing high school, because you need to have a high school degree, up to their 80s. Uh, so the oldest is uh, 83 years old or was 83 years old, older today, I guess. Uh, and the average age is uh, in mid-30s. So I think this shows that we have a very nice and broad course, which um, uh, yeah, attracts a broad range of uh, participants. Uh, so if we look at the evaluation, this course has been very well received, as we saw from the class uh, central, but also in the university course has been very well uh, received. Uh, so the students feel that the, the time that they are supposed to spend on the course correspond to what they need to spend. Uh, and uh, so in some sense, the most kind of complaints are, is about the administrative parts. So someone even said that it's, the administrative parts take more time than the, the course itself. Um, so, so here we have some challenges, but in some sense, it's outside of our control because it's basically based on uh, the way that you, yeah, university admittance and uh, these procedures are set up. Uh, so therefore, it's challenging to, to uh, make this as much more smooth. Uh, however, on our side, we have been able to automate as much as possible. So actually, we can, we can maintain this with relatively modest uh, human effort. And we see also we get very good uh, course evaluations. We get 4.4 uh, 4 out of 5. Uh, and actually, 4.65 a question where the content uh, was needed to, to reach the course goal. So overall, the course is very well received by the students, which we are very happy for. So uh, to conclude, uh, in this presentation, I presented this Elements of AI, uh, an open online course developed by uh, University of Helsinki in Finland uh, with support of Reactor, uh, and that's been uh, translated into Sweden and brought to Sweden by, by Linköping University. Um, AI Innovation in Sweden, AI Competence for Sweden, uh, with supporting funding from Vinova. And we've been able to uh, reach roughly 40, more than 40,000 people in Sweden, and more than 3,000 people have actually received university credits for this course. And it's also getting very uh, good course evaluations. So overall, we believe this is a great example of how to help the general population learn more about AI. Thank you for your uh, interest. And if you have any questions, please get in touch. Thank you.